Well, praise the Lord. God's good. Amen? Amen. All the time. Praise the Lord. Take your Bibles this morning, please, and turn with me to the 142nd Psalm. Psalm chapter 142 this morning. How many of you are a little tired this morning? A little tired? How many, how many of you are a whole lot tired? <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, I'll try to keep you awake for the next 35 or 40 minutes. And uh, the Lord will give us grace and help. Now, while you're finding your place this morning, I want to ask you a question. And uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, all right? I, if you, I don't want you to respond. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to shout amen. But I want to ask you this morning. I wonder how many of you today are, are struggling with this thing called loneliness. Loneliness. Are you lonely? Do you experience Times in your life when you are lonely? Are you maybe even living, you might say, with loneliness? You know, if I had asked for a show of hands, I'm sure that there would have been many in this room this morning that would have been glad to admit that they're lonely, they need, they, they have a need that, that, that is not being, uh, filled a void in their heart, maybe that's not filled this morning and, I'm sure several of you would have would have responded, but I'm also very sure that many of you, if not the overwhelming majority in this room this morning, who are struggling with loneliness would be ready to admit it. This seems to be something that is not often uh, dealt with from the pulpits of, of churches and even in our independent Baptist movement. We just don't want to go there. We don't want to talk about those things. And and people have trouble talking about loneliness in their life. And maybe that's because when you admit, when by admitting that you are lonely, it seems to make you, or it makes you seem rather uh, weak. Maybe you think of somebody who is lonely as a weak person. Or maybe even a vulnerable, vulnerable person. Um, and sometimes that can be the case because we see, uh, especially during the holiday season, so many scams and cons. <clears throat> people trying to, to con others and take advantage of people who may be missing someone during the holiday seasons. Lonely. Maybe you're lonely this morning because of a death in your family. Maybe the death of a husband or a wife has made you lonely. Maybe you're lonely because of a, of a divorce or separation. Someone you poured your heart into and loved and, and now is, is separated and maybe divorced from you. you. You tried to save your marriage and it just wouldn't be saved. You're lonely. Maybe you're lonely uh, this morning because of distance. Maybe someone is is far away that you love and you can't see them. Um, and you can't touch them and hug them and, and you're lonely because of that. Uh, maybe this morning you're lonely because uh, of something so, so far out of your um, uh, cap- uh, capacity to remedy. Maybe a disease like, like dementia or Alzheimer's has, has left you lonely. For that person you used to know, who's no longer there in their mind. So there are a lot of ways this morning, there are a lot of causes for loneliness. And so I want to deal with this. King David was a man who was also lonely. He felt the pain of loneliness. And I think that Psalm 142, this psalm was written during a time of great loneliness in David's life. Now let's stand together. I'm going to read all first seven verses. It's not a long psalm, but I want you to notice that under the word Psalm 142, maybe in your Bible, you'll have this subtitle, Maskell of David, a prayer 
when he was in the cave. And we're going to, to deal with that for just a moment, in a moment. But notice what he writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I, I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they privately laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand, and beheld, and, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. And notice, if you would again, that little phrase in verse 4, when he said, No man cared for my soul. David was lonely. He felt like he was being captured and was was captivated, was imprisoned in this cave with his loneliness. This morning I want to talk to you a little bit on this subject, living with loneliness. Now Lord, I pray that you'd help me. I pray that you'd help me to be a blessing and a help and an encouragement to those in this room, especially who are lonely. We will all, I think, in some time of our life feel this pain, this burden, this void, this emptiness called loneliness. And God, I pray today that you might help us to explore it, to capture it uh, in, in definition and also in how we might conquer it, deal with it in our lives. So help us today. We ask in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. You might be seated this morning. So here's a problem. A problem that's often overlooked because it can be embarrassing. It can often bring a bit of embarrassment or humility to those who admit it, but they're just, they're lonely. They, 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 they don't have someone, they're, they're missing someone. There's a void, an emptiness, maybe an empty chair at the table. Someone used to be at that chair and they're not there anymore. You miss them, you're lonely. You used to share a bed with somebody, a spouse, and they're gone. You shared a life with a friend, and now they're gone. You're hurting. You're hurting. And many times others don't see that. And sometimes we hide it. We do our best to mask it. You see, as adults, we tell our children, not to give in to peer pressure. But we as adults give in to what we might call appear pressure. We want to appear that we're in control. We want to appear that everything's okay. We come to church and we want others to look at us and we want to appear that we're making it okay. That we're not suffering on the inside. Our lives couldn't be better, we tell folks. And we appear that we have it all under control, but that's not always the case. To be honest, we're hypocrites. We're hypocrites. We learn to be hypocritical with our emotions. Now, what's so wrong with us as a family sharing when we hurt? Is anything wrong with that? Why shouldn't we be able to confess our faults one to another. And to share what's hurting us. What's got us down. What our burdens are. Where we're hurting. But oh no, you see, that, that little bit of pride coupled with that hypocrisy. And so we put on the front that we're okay. And so instead of facing the loneliness, we mask it in hypocrisy. But I'm telling you this morning, loneliness is 
a reality of life. Especially during the holiday season. When it comes to loneliness, many times it's not what others do to us that causes loneliness. Many times it's what others don't do to us that makes our loneliness unbearable. It's when those we know don't call us. They don't talk to us. That makes our life unbearable. It's what others don't do. They don't, our friends don't remember us on special days, holidays, birthdays. It's when those inside our circle of family and friends fail to visit us when we're sick and, and, and encourage us when we're discouraged. They just leave us alone to wrestle with our loneliness. And can I say this morning, and I think you well know this, that a person can be lonely even in a crowd. I noticed a Time News article not too long ago about this thing of loneliness, and, and the magazine called it the next great health epidemic in our country. Since 2020, when COVID came in and they told everybody to lock down and close their doors and not fellowship and not go to church. You remember that? Didn't, it wasn't that long ago. And you remember they was telling us now we can't even show our face to one another. We got to hide behind a mask, you know. And at that point was a real turning point in relationships. Even those that were in the Nursing homes couldn't see their loved ones except through a pane of glass. They couldn't hold their hand as they were dying. You remember that? They couldn't go in there and be with their loved one. And there was loneliness. And I'm, I, I, I grant you this morning that many of those deaths in those nursing homes wasn't just old age, wasn't just some disease. It was just plain old-fashioned loneliness that got them. How many times have you known of somebody who had been together 60, 70, 80 years maybe, lived a lifetime sharing that life with somebody, a spouse they loved, and when that spouse died, it wasn't too many days after that the other would die. Why? Loneliness on loneliness. You see, and even though we're surrounded by others, doesn't mean that we're not lonely, doesn't mean we're not hurting. The little lady who was dealing with a a issue of blood for so many years was in the great crowd of people who were there to see Jesus and she fought and scrambled and pushed and shoved until she got to where she could just at least reach out and touch the hem of his garment because she was struggling. She was lonely even in a crowd. King David, here in our text, was surrounded by people he had been, he was running from King Saul. He's in hiding in a cave, and yet he did have a group of people, at least 600 men that were there with him. But although he was surrounded by people, he was lonely there in that cave. Verse 4 tells us, he reveals his soul, and he says, No man cares. Nobody cares for my soul. Now, Understand this morning that when it comes to loneliness, when you and I are missing someone, it's because you have a soul relationship with that person. Not just a physical relationship, not just a business relationship, not just a, a, a church affiliation or, or relationship. You have a soul relationship. That's why we talk about to young people, we express this to them many times. We'll say when you're, when you're looking for a, a person to spend the rest of your life with, you need a soul mate. The only cure for this soul sickness called loneliness is a soul mate. And when that soul mate is not there, loneliness creeps in. Am I right? Say amen. amen. Oh, how we need to understand it's not about a lot of people. It's not some of the loneliest people in the world can be found in the largest of cities. New York City. Large town. Lots of lonely people. Steve Jobs. You know the name? Steve Jobs died October the 5th, 2011 of pancreatic cancer. By the way, in my study I found out that he could have tried certain 
things that had been proved and 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 he could have he could have been spared but for some reason he decided not to he tried herbal uh remedies and other things but it didn't work and he went and he passed away October the 5th 2011 I do not know if he was a Christian or not but I did find this that on his deathbed he spoke these words listen carefully quote I have reached the pinnacle of success in the business world in others eyes my life is the epitome of success however aside from work I have little joy in the end, my wealth is only a fact of life that I'm accustomed to. At this moment, lying on my bed and recalling my life as I die, I realize that all the recognition and all the wealth that I took so much pride in have paled and become meaningless in the face of my death. You can employ someone to drive the car for you, make money for you, but you cannot have someone bear your sickness for you. Material things lost can be found or replaced. But there's one thing that can never be found when it's lost, and that's life. Whichever stage in life you're in right now with time, you will face the day when the curtain will fall. Treasure love for your family. Treasure love for your spouse. Treasure love for your friends. Treat yourself well and cherish others. As we grow older and hopefully wiser, we realize that a $3,000 or a $30 watch both tell the same time. You will realize that your true inner happiness does not come from the material things of this world, whether you fly first class or economy. If the plane goes down... You go down with it. Therefore, I hope you realize, he said, when you have mates, buddies, old friends, brothers and sisters who you chat with, laugh with, talk with, sing with, that is true success. That's true happiness. Don't educate your children to be rich. Educate them to be happy so when they grow up, they will know the value of things and not the price. End of quote. Can I tell you something this morning? Relationships are far more valuable than riches. And lonely is the man or the woman who gets those two out of order. What makes loneliness so bad, so hard to bear? Understand loneliness has to do with more than just another person being within reach. Loneliness is a state of mind. It's an, it's an emotion that lives and grows inside the soul. And that beast of loneliness in your soul can only be conquered by the understanding and the recognition of another soul. We think of a soulmate, we think about a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, but being a soulmate has very little to do with the physical. It has everything to do with the soul and the spirit of a person. For example, David, again, King David, when he was just a boy, you remember that? He would grow up to be the man after God's own heart, David, but he felt lonely as a boy. He spent many days and nights in the field, the open field, watching his father's sheep. No one to talk to, just the sheep. Then one day, he slew Goliath. And even though the crowd was writing songs about his success, he still battled loneliness. King Saul wanted him dead, and David ran for his life. And the Bible tells us that God gave him something very, very precious in those moments. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 18, 1, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul... That the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. You see, you're knit with somebody. Maybe it's your wife, your husband. Maybe it's a friend. But someone has become your soulmate in that you have someone to share your heart with. Your thoughts with. Your ambitions with your hopes with. 
And that knitting of those souls together gives you strength because the Bible says in another place that two are better than one. And when God allows you that to have a soulmate, you're knit together. What a wonderful relationship that is. And how horrible it is when it's broken. Someone may ask, well, preacher, where did loneliness, loneliness begin? How did it get its start? Can I tell you something this morning where it got its start? It got its start in the Garden of Eden. Think about it. Even before sin entered into the picture, even before Adam transgressed and brought sin and death into the, into, into mankind and humankind and history, even before that, Adam was given the responsibility to name all the animals. You think about all the animals, all oh, so many hundreds and thousands of animals that God created and He introduced each one to Adam and Adam said, I'll call this a peacock. I'll call this a horse. I'll call this a cat. And he gave names to all those things. What a smart man he was. What a successful man he was. He was the king of the earth and the king of that garden. And yet, he was lonely. He looked around to all them animals and there was no animal that he could knit his soul with. There was no animal that could think like he did. No other creature that could share life with him as it, as, as it related to him and his humanity. And the Bible says in Genesis 2 verse 18, 18, the Lord God says, Not good the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. In other words, I'm going to make him a helper. Someone that is like him. Who is more than just body and spirit. But I'm going to, I'm going to give him a soul. I'm going to breathe my spirit inside of him. He's going to become a living soul. And just like I did that for Adam, I'm going to do that for her. I'm going to make, make, him, make her rather out of his body. She will become his help, meet his soul, mate. Loneliness, what is it? I like the definition that Dr. Charles Stanley gives in his message called Living in the Shadows of Loneliness. He said this, quote, Loneliness is a separation anxiety brought on by the feeling of being disconnected, out of touch. It's the loss of intimacy or feeling of belonging. Many people are there today, maybe some in this room right now. Let me give you quickly three characteristics, just three. There are many more, but just three characteristics of loneliness. Then I'm going to give you three things to remember when you're lonely. First of all, notice the subtitle again. I said I was going to get back to that. Psalm 142, Maskell of David, a prayer when he was in the cave. Understand, first of all, that lonely people, lonely people feel isolated and forgotten. They feel isolated and forgotten. They're lonely. David was in the cave. He was running for his life. Nobody could quite understand how he felt. He was lonely. He needed somebody to share his thoughts with. Somebody, but, but, but there was no man to do that with. No person that he could do that with. No living human being that was, was there. And he felt as if nobody even cared. He was isolated in that cave by himself. We believe it was a cave that was called Adullam. A cave where he frequented often. But this was a time when he was running, running away from Saul and using that as a shelter place. And, and he was lonely. And he was isolated. He felt forgotten. I wonder how many of you this morning, you feel that way. You feel like nobody understands and nobody cares. And you wonder why you, you, you're having to go through this. It's a cave experience. But let me tell you something this morning. You're not forgotten. I may forget you. You may forget somebody. Somebody may forget you. Others may not understand but I'm telling you I know one who does I know one who does and and God cares for you you may be lonely this morning but I'm telling you God cares for you he cares for you lonely people listen this morning and and, and lonely people God you know why we're lonely because God did not create us to be loners we're social creatures we're not hermits God created us for fellowship. First John 1 7 says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So when, 
When fellowship is lost, loneliness comes in to take its place. You know, I've counseled people man, many times throughout the year, uh, throughout the years of my ministry, who would come to me and say, Preacher, I'm hurting on the inside, I'm, I'm lonely, and, and I feel like I'm the cause, I'm the blame. And that's not always the case. Your life is hard. Sometimes uh, others can be hard and, 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 and hurtful. And sometimes you get lonely and, and you feel misunderstood. And don't blame yourself, okay? Please don't go down that road. The devil would love to heap guilt on you in moments like that as if it was your fault. Why didn't we do this? And why didn't we take care of that? And, and maybe it's my fault that this didn't work out. And maybe it's my fault that my loved one is not well. Maybe it's my fault that they passed. Don't go down that road because that's the devil speaking to you. The devil will throw guilt on you as if it's all your fault. Don't, don't let him do that. Being lonely is not a sin. It's not a sin. Notice what he said in verse number 2. He said, I, I poured out my complaint before him. He didn't call it a sin to be lonely. It was a complaint. It was a trouble. I showed before him my trouble. He said, my spirit was overwhelmed. Maybe you feel that way this morning. Maybe, maybe this morning you feel like that, that nobody else can understand or, or is there to understand you, but I'm telling you, lonely people, I, I, I encourage you this morning, there are others out there that are experience the same thing. They know where you're at. God knows where you're at. Crying. He said in the first two words of verse 1, I cried. I cried. Nothing wrong for you exp to experience that and to express your loneliness through tears. I knew, uh, Sorla and I knew a lady some years ago that lost her husband in a tragic, tragic oil field fire. Horrible, horrible situation. The man was a good man. He was a song director in our church. He loved people. He was just the most jolliest, happiest guy. Everybody loved him. His name was Bubba. Everybody called him Bubba. And Bubba died in this tragic accident. He was working on a um, a, a pipeline or something and, and, and it exploded and he caught on fire and he was just burnt from head to, to, to foot. On his way to the hospital via a emergency helicopter, I think they, they flew him to, I flighted him to, to Dallas area, to Parkland. And as he was going, he was in such pain and they tell me that the ETs, work, the emergency uh, technicians, and they were working with him there and trying to trying to help him and and he has already started swelling up his body and because because of the fires and the burn the body reaction and he was telling the fellas fellas I'm burning I feel like I'm in hell he said I don't want you to go to hell are you a Christian are you saved he was witnessing to those people as he was dying he got to the hospital and finally he wasn't able to he succumbed to his injuries and and I saw that precious wife of his. During the funeral service, she had not one tear. She tried to act so bold, didn't she, Miss Starley? You remember? She sat there as she tried to be courageous, lying like. She tried to exhibit that, that she was a strong woman. But I'm telling you, because of that, I think she suffered so much the more later on. Because there are times when we need to cry and we need to express those things in our life. That's why God gave you that ability to cry, you see. It's those tears are, and those eyes, those tear ducts are relief valves. <laughs> when the pressure is so hard and so unbearable, that's where it pops out. That's where the relief comes from, crying and crying out to God. Amen. Nothing wrong with that at all. Amen. Somebody said years ago, tears or, the, or a language that only God understands. Great song. Yes, God understands. Lonely people feel isolated. They feel uh, forgotten. They, they cry. And, 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 and so many of these things we see expressed in David in this psalm. But I want to share with you quickly three, three quickly things that, <clears throat> that you need to remember when you're lonely. Number one, remember God cares for you. I know that does not sound, that sounds so trite, but it's not trite. It's so important. You've got to be reminded that when you're lonely, God still cares about you. 
He knows where you're at. Notice what David said there. I looked on my right hand, verse 4. I looked, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Listen, you may think nobody is there around you to help you, to understand you, but God is. God is. There's no song in our song books called Does Jesus Care? I won't sing it, but I want you to listen to the words. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song? When the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? Oh, yes, He cares. I know He cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long night dreary, I know my Savior cares. Aren't you glad He cares this morning? I'm glad He cares. Remember, God cares about you. Number two, remember that Jesus is your friend. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, Proverbs 18, verse 24 says. Oh, listen. The word refuge in verse 5 is an interesting word. Thou art my refuge. I looked it up because I was curious that there might be something I'm missing. And I looked that word up and got to study in. The word refuge means a person or a place of trust. Some place where you feel like you can just be yourself. And if you have to fall to pieces, fall to pieces. But you're in a place that you can trust. With a person you can trust. Listen, you can trust Jesus. I don't care what you throw at Him. You can trust Him to understand. You can trust Him to care. Nothing you can say. You can't... Listen, He's not going to say, Well, I've had enough of this. I'm going... No, He'll stay with you as long as you want Him to. He'll he'll listen to you as long as you want Him to. I remember thinking about what Jesus said to His disciples in John 15. He said, Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known unto you. I'm glad that I have a friend in Jesus. A little personal uh, illustration. I remember many years ago when I was in high school. And so my junior year, we'd finished my junior year and went into the summer between my junior and and senior year. And something wonderful happened to me. I got saved. I was living with my dad in an upstairs garage apartment. And, uh, and uh, so he was a drunkard, and, and it was not a good scenario. But I remember we went to church, uh, and I got saved. And oh, how my heart changed. But the next year, as, as the new year came in, Kilgore High School, and I went to Kilgore High School my senior year, and I'm a brand-new creature. Say, boy, so excited. Came to church or came to school with my Bible under my arms. And when I walked back on the campus, all my old friends turned their back. They didn't want nothing to do with me. I was too fanatical. I was too religious. I love God too much, I guess. You know, a fanatic is just somebody that loves God more than you. That's a fanatic. Oh, yeah, they went to church, but man, come on now, you know. You're not going to smoke in the boys' room with us. You're not going to do drugs with us. You're not going to curse and carry on till dirt. No. It's an interesting thing. When I got saved, I didn't have to worry about giving my friends up. They gave me up. And I felt lonely. I really did. And I remembered as I studied the Word of God and read the Word of God, I remember where the Bible says in Hebrews 13, I think it is, He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Isn't that a great verse? And I'm so glad that God will never leave me nor forsake me. Remember, God cares about you. Jesus is your friend. And number three, remember, your church family, this is your spiritual family, is here for you. We're here for you. Notice verse 7. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. Listen to this phrase. The righteous shall compass me about. What's he talking about? The word compass means to enclose, to encircle, to surround, in order to protect, to provide for. And in fact, the word compass is the root word for compassion. Listen, 
That's what church is all about. That's, this is one of the main reasons we come together, that we're a part of this church. It's because we need each other, folks. I said we need each other. You think we're talking about being independent Baptists. And I, so, I know so many independent Baptists that are so independent that you, you think they never needed nobody for nothing. Now, I know that's not good English, but that's the truth. I'm independent. No, listen. I'm dependent. Yes, I'm independent of denominations. Yes, I'm independent of all that stuff. But, but, but when it comes to my Christian life, I'm dependent. I need you, Mark. I need you, Miss Barbara. I need you, Dana. I need you, folks. I need you. Need me. I need you. We need each other. Amen. We got to. We we've got to have each other. We need each other. Boy, I was talking about Wednesday, last Wednesday night. Well, last Tuesday night. What a great service that was. How many times did we hear somebody say, "I'm so thankful for my church family." Our prayer wall. Thank God for the prayer wall. If you hadn't used it yet, you're missing a blessing. People are actually stopping and praying. When there's somebody posts on there and says, I need you to pray for so-and-so, I stop. My wife stops. We pray. That prayer wall, that's special. You know why? Because we have a special relationship in this church. It's, it's, it, we're together. We're a body. Fitly framed together so that we can go through this journey called life together. In the beginning of our country, you've heard me say it so often, oh, Ben Franklin said, fellas, if we do not hang together, we will most assuredly hang separately. The fact is, we've got to hang together. We need each other. Let's compass each other. Let's compass each other and have compassion on each other. Why? Because we need each other. You're lonely this morning. I know there's so much more that could be said. But if you'll remember that God cares for you, If you'll remember that Jesus is still your friend, he's still there, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And number three, if you'll remember that we're here, the church, don't be ashamed. Don't don't ever be ashamed to say, I need your prayers. Listen, if there's one thing that bothers me about modern Christianity is this, is that somehow we have have, um, shrouded ourselves, you know, and, and we've become isolated, we've We've become, we've insulated. There's a word I'm looking for. We've insulated ourselves. Okay? And, and we make it as if we really don't need anybody else's touch or prayers or, or encouragement. But my friend, we do. Look, if I'm unable to encourage you from this pulpit, that may be one thing. That's why I hurry at the end of the service to get that door so that as you're leaving, I want you to know the last thing you hear from me is, hey, I love you. God bless you. I'm praying for you. So good to see you. Call me if you need me. Those are the kind of things I say as you go. Why? Because I want you to know that I am here for you. And you are here for me, and we're all here together for each other and God. Oh, how we need each other. Oh, how we need each other. That's what church is all about. I know I don't want to get too personal. I think about Miss Barbara Washington. What a dear saint of God. Love the Lord. Loves the Lord. Struggling with a husband who, not struggling, but challenged by his disease. And I wonder how many tears she shed through, through these past months and years over that. You know, what would it hurt any of us just to come up to her and give her a hug and say, hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you. And mean it. Because, you know... That might be the very thing she needs today. All of us have some issue. Let's love. We're to bear each other's burdens. Bear ye one another's burdens. That's scripture. Why? Because a lot of lonely people in this world. Let's do our best to get past that because you see the devil will use that against us if we're not careful. Father, I pray this morning that you'd help. I pray that you encourage. I pray this morning that this message is something I've said this morning would help those who are lonely to know that they're not alone. It's one thing to be lonely. It's another thing to be alone. We're, let them know that, that we've not left them alone. And we're not alone in this thing. We have others 